All right, welcome everybody. This is the uh, introduction to the uh, CNCF Serverless Working Group and the Cloud Events Project. Um, I'm Doug Davis, I work for IBM. Um, I'm also I, a co-chair of the Serverless Working Group and the Cloud Events Project. And then we have Clemens here. Yes, my name is Clemens Fastas and I uh, work for Microsoft. And uh, I'm a uh, co-author on uh, uh, some of the specification for Cloud Events and uh, We'll show you some things. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's get started. OK, so what we're basically going to do here is talk about very quickly some of the histories of where we got, or how we got to where we are today between the serverless working group in the CNCF and then the cloud event specification, which is an offshoot from the service working group. And as part of that, we'll talk about what we're doing in the cloud events working group, like talk about SDKs, status of cloud events demo. Actually, I, the order here is a little mixed up. We changed it at the last second, so I apologize that this actually doesn't line up with the order. I apologize, but I blame Clemens. It was his yes, idea. Yes, my fault. Yes. So let's start with the serverless working group. So around mid-2017, the Technical Oversight Committee, which is sort of the governing board of the, um, governing board is the right word, the, the Technical Oversight Board, if you want to call it, committee, of the CNCF was sort of, is sort of providing the technical direction for the CNCF, uh, started here obviously hearing about serverless like everybody else did. And they basically wanted to figure out what, if anything, should the CNCF do about serverless? Maybe nothing, maybe get more involved, try to write, find projects to bring in CNCF, whatever. So what they decided to do was to form a working group whose purpose in life was to basically help answer that question. So they were chartered to produce a white paper that basically provided an overview of the serverless technology itself, state of the ecosystem, and then recommendations for next possible steps. And that the result of that is a PDF document. You can see it um, on the website itself under the CNCF serverless working group. And it basically does everything I listed there, right? It tells you everything you need to know about serverless, comparing it with other ASs, you know, um, comparing FAS versus serverless versus PaaS versus containers of service, when you should use each one, anything you might want to know about serverless, including the architecture of popular ways to implement it. And we also included in there a landscape document, which is really just a fancy way of saying, what's out there today? What are the open source versions of serverless or function as service frameworks? Uh, what are the pr proprietary ones? Uh, what are the popular languages that are supported? Things you might want to know when you're going to pick a particular service framework or what, ser what services you want to use with your serverless framework. Just general information about what's out there in the industry. But the key thing here, for us anyway, was the last bullet that's nested under there is recommendations for next possible steps. So what we basically did is we said, um, serverless, you know, here it is, and it's all its glory. But in terms of next steps, we really should look at possibly standardizing or harmonizing some of the efforts here. Because a lot of people are doing the same type of thing, but the way the application developer or user is using it is different for each platform. So are there some things we can standardize on just to make the life easier? Right Now, we're not trying to constrict what they're trying to do from a functionality perspective. Just make things a little more portable or interoperable for the end user. Right? It's all about the end user here. And so one of the sort of low-hanging fruits that we came across was the events that are actually coming into the system that kick off these functions. We thought, well, a lot of these things could, could benefit, from, or these events could benefit from some level of standardization here. Not in so much in the terms of standardizing what the event itself looks like from a uh, soup to nuts perspective, but just in terms of routing it to the application. And we'll go into a little more details there, but that's what was one of the recommendations was cloud events. We had other recommendations around education and stuff like that, but that was really one of the bigger ones was the cloud event spec. The other thing that we decided to do later on was to look at uh, work after cloud events, which is function workflow, and I'll talk very briefly about that later on in the presentation. But that's sort of what the serverless working group was done and we're now, that same group of people has now shifted focus to the cloud event specification. So while the serverless working group isn't actually producing a whole lot, it's not like they're dead or anything. It's just they're, everybody's focused on cloud events. When that one's sort of done, cloud events, the uh, serverless working group will spin back up, figure out what we're going to do next, and then move on to the next thing. So let's talk about cloud events, because that's actually the more interesting one to me right now. So around 2017, December 2017, Cloud Events project started with the goal of trying to see if we can standardize to some degree the events that come into these function as a service platforms or serverless platforms. Now, keep in mind, we're not trying to produce yet another cloud event structure to rule them all. We've already done that before many, many, many times. Okay? What we're trying to do is figure out what is the minimum set of metadata needed by the infrastructure receiving the events to just route it properly 
within the infrastructure, whether it's to the application or to the next layer, middle layer, doesn't matter. What is the bare minimum needed to just to do some routing? And if you look at the little nested bullets here, the four that are in bold are basically the four required attributes that we decided are needed to get that job done. Level of the specification, meaning the cloud event spec, just so people know what properties are expected. That's a, sort of an easy one. But type of the event, right? Is this, for example, a GitHub issue create type of event? That type of thing. Source, who produced the event itself? And then a unique ID, just so you can do things like uh, deduping or um, stuff like that. You know, you need some sort of unique identifier for this particular event or do correlation, those th type of things. Now we do have other optional properties like the time of the event, content type, and schema URL. Those are there, very similar to what you might see in HTTP headers, that describe the event data itself, just in case you need that information to help your processing of it. But notice the bare minimum that's required. It's really type, source, and ID. That's it, right? With that basic information, you should be able to get the message off the wire, through the infrastructure, and hopefully to the next layer in the processing model, application, middleware, whatever that may be. Right? Notice we don't get into what does the event structure look like, meaning the application data, just these headers, or these, these actual properties. Now, in my mind, I tend to think of this very similar to HTTP. Right? If you think about HTTP, HTTP defines some common headers, but then the body is up to the application to figure out what it looks like and to do with, right? But those minimum number of headers allow the infrastructure to receive a message and pass it on to the application. That's a very similar model to what we're doing here. Because if you look at this list, it actually doesn't seem that exciting if you look at it. But with that minimum amount of data, we're hoping to have a, a large amount of benefit relative to portability and interoperability going forward. Now, with that basic understanding or basic set of uh, properties in front of us, we then said, okay, that's great, got these properties. We need to actually do something a little bit more with that to get some interoperability. So what we did, we defined how these things are gonna be serialized. Not just in terms of format, like JSON and stuff like that, but also what do they look like on the wire? Again, this is all about interoperability. If we don't agree to that, you're not gonna get that. So let's keep moving forward then. So let's take a very concrete example. <clears throat> Let's say you have this particular event flowing into your system, right? It's just you're posting it to some URL that ends in slash events, and you have inside the HTTP body action, new item with some ID, okay? Application data, nothing special about this. So what does cloud events actually do here? Or what is it gonna look like? Take those four properties I mentioned in the previous slide. They appear here, right? We're looking at cloud events specification 0.2. The type of the event, in this particular case, a unique URL that uniquely describes the event itself. So, you have, so the receiver knows what type of event it is without having to crack open the HTTP body. In this case, it's a repo.new new item. That URL is defined by the producer. Consumers can look at the documentation and know what to expect. Source, bigco.com repo. Unique identifier of the event producer. Nothing earth shattering there. And then just some unique identifier. With that basic information, we're hoping we can get some level of reliability again to deliver this to the proper destination. And the infrastructure that may need to process this in some way, maybe do some correlation, maybe just figure out how to route it properly to say, oh, I need to route this to the functions that are gonna handle repo.star type of events. It can now write it, route it properly. Much in the same way, the, the post on the top with the URL is used by routing by the HTTP uh, server itself, okay? Minimal amount of data, just to help the interoperability of routing. Now, in this particular format, we call this the binary format, because basically it's, uh, you, you don't really touch much in terms of the data, all we do is add some additional HTTP headers. Now, for those who actually want everything wrapped up with an HTTP body, we do define it as the quote, the structured data. But you'll notice it's basically the exact same data, right? Those HTTP headers become JSON properties, the HTTP body gets embedded inside of a data property. Take your pick in terms of how you want to send the data out. It's up to you. But hopefully, I think our specification actually says receivers are, should accept both formats. But some people may want to send it in one versus the other for performance reasons or something like that. Okay? So with that, as I said before, our goal here is to try to normalize the events just so we can get interop across all these, variable, uh, all these various environments, right? To, inter to facilitate interoperability and to help out the users to, to make their things a little bit more portable. We are not trying to touch the business logic. We're not trying to define common event structure, just the minimal metadata. And again, this is all about the first steps towards interoperability, because as I said, once we're done with this, we're gonna, in the serverless working group, we're gonna go back and figure out what we wanna do next in terms of what's ne the next pain point for users on this interoperability and portability uh, uh,
field uh, problem space out there. OK, so the deliverables for the Cloud Events working group itself, or project itself. Obviously, we have the specification itself, which defines the properties. We have the serialization rules I talked about, the formats, the transport bindings. You can see them listed up there in binary, or in black, or I'm sorry, bold. We also have a primer, which is basically there for educational purposes, right? It tells you what the specification's about, where it's, how you should use it, um, some of the design decisions we made. Because we made some very interesting design decisions that I'm not gonna go into here, but some people may think they're actually kind of funky. But we do explain why we do it, and we tried to have really good reasons for it. But we, we don't want to have to, people have to guess as to why we did it and think we we're just insane. We actually tried to write down our logic. And finally, we have some SDKs to make life easier for people to actually use this stuff. Even though the number of things we have in the specification, just those properties, are relatively minor, we figured an SDK might help people jumpstart the process in actually using these things. And Clemens will talk more about the SDKs in a minute. So with that, we heard doing a time. OK, let me actually do a demo. Um, because for us, it's much more fun to actually see things actually flowing. And it actually helps verify that actually what we're producing can actually work. So how many here know the, the game when you're a child called Mad Libs? OK, most people, not, but not everybody. So the point of this game is you have at least two people. One person is given something like this, a sentence with missing words. Below the missing words, there's the type of word that goes in there, adjective, adjective, noun, noun in this particular case. The person who gets this asks other people, or the other people playing the game, to just randomly pick a word of that category. Now, those people cannot see the sentence, so they have no clue what, how these words are going to be used in the final sentence. And the point here is they're going to come up with some random words. You fill it in. You get a funny sentence, and the kids all laugh. It's a lot of fun. OK, so we're going to do the same thing here. OK, so what we have is a cloud event controller, basically the, the brain of the thing who actually understands the sentence is going to be asking for the words. So it's going to choose a random sentence, figure out the missing words. It's going to then create an event. In this particular case, the, the type is word.found.noun, in this particular case, or adjective or whatever. It is then going to send that event out to all of these various pro, uh, function platforms out there who have subscribed to receive this event. You have all of them out there. Let's see, uh, IBM, um, Knative itself, which is not company specific, obviously. Oracle, OpenFAS, part of VMware, uh, VMware proper, Microsoft, Huawei, SAP, and PayPal. OK? So each one of those is going to receive the event, pick a random word of that particular category type, and then it's going to produce another event on the outbound side, event type word.picked.noun. Each of those is going to send it back to the controller. And then the controller is going to pick one of those words from all the people that responded for each word category and then display it on the screen. Kind of hokey, but still fun. Again, it's to prove out the point here of interoperability. All right, so let's go ahead and show it. Do, 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 do. It's see. also very pretty. It also is very pretty, yes. True. All right, so here you see the cloud controller in the middle. We have all the functions around there, and hopefully, and this is actually a little scary. The, actually, the events, the whole system here is actually driven by the browser. So if the network here fails me, we're dead. <laughs> Don't laugh. <laughs> yes. OK, here we go. Well, the entire presentation. So you saw them go out. Everybody's responding back. Each one got, what is it, three, four words. And there you go. So for dessert, Joseph is bringing a love pie with apartment. I'm feeling safe already. OK? Goofy, fun. But the point here is you saw the events go out. Everybody responded. The events come back. And you can actually see the, the uh, actually, can you actually read that? Actually, you guys can't. It's not that bad. Yeah, so the words in red are the words that the controller actually picked when it was done. Okay? Just so you can see it again, you can actually see the events flowing back and forth. Right? Actually, I kind of goofed up a little here. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't actually read it. As far as you know, the Easter Bunny loves to, oh, never mind. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> OK, so obviously some of these may not be safe for work. I knew. Uh, yeah. I actually was a little afraid of that, but you know, live on the edge. I actually, I messed up a little. What I should have done is shown you the words before. You can actually see here's the sentence with the, at, with the noun, I'm sorry, with the word types in there before it actually does it. So please excuse blank, who's far too blank to attend blank class. This one actually tends, out, turn, tends to be kind of funny as well. So let's see what happens on this one when it actually runs, just for fun. 
He's far too broad to attend movie class. Okay, and sometimes it gets much more creative than that. So anyway, a little fun little demo, but let's go ahead and pick on K-Native. That way it's a little bit neutral. Oh gosh, you guys can't see that, can you? No. Anyway, let's see if I can make it bigger. Oh, it does work. Cool. Okay, so you can actually see in this particular case the event that was sent across. Binary mode is being used here, so you can see the cloud event headers, the CE ID, source, spec version, time and type, sent across, received by the Knative infrastructure, and when it responded, you could see this one at time, it picked oven as its word, because it was looking for a noun, and you can see the cloud event properties, or HTTP headers, on the way back, okay? Like I said, kind of a goofy sample and stuff, but you can see this stuff does actually work. Yes. All right, so let's see. Go back here. Yeah, let's do one more just for fun, see what it comes up with. How are we doing on time? Oh, okay. Hopefully it's not too bad for work. Okay, not too bad. Yes. Okay, moving back to the slides. All right, so with that, what I'm gonna do now is turn it over to Clemens, who will talk about our SDK work. Great. Yeah, so the SDKs that we have um, are uh, numerous by now. Um, we have um, coverage for Go, Java, JavaScript. You can, you can see this, uh, C Sharp. I'm going to show you some of those languages. The goal is to provide access to cloud events in a very easy way um, and for most languages in a way that is allowing you to use your favorite current tool set with which you do use you know, HTTP or AMQP or MQTT. Um, we're not, none of the SDKs are aspiring to create yet another HTTP client, but rather help that HTTP client um, do <coughs> inter interoperate effectively with um, um, cloud events and also do the same thing on the server side. So for this, I have now been taught that I need to do this, yes. Um, so here, um, I thought slides would be um, interesting, but showing you the GitHub repo would be more interesting. So when you go to uh, um, GitHub Cloud Events, what you'll find is um, a bunch of repos, and we filter here on SDK. You'll find the SDK for Go and for Java, for JavaScript, for Python, for Ruby, C Sharp. The, the, layer, the, the, the level of that code is um, alpha. It's, we're co confident enough in that code that it's worth your time looking at it. Um, you should not bet the farm on it, and it's an open source effort, which means if you find a bug, then you have the choice between reporting it or giving us a PR, and the latter is probably preferred um, for all those. So I'll give you a flavor of um, that code using one that I'm um, uh, familiar with, uh, and that's C-sharp because I'm a Microsoft dude. Um, so here's how mo all of the SDKs give you an OM, an object model for what a cloud event is. Um, so you create a new cloud event, um, you give the, the type, you give the source, and then um, here in this particular one, in this SDK, there's support for extensions. And what I'll talk about in the deep dive tomorrow, same time, is uh, our extensions model that we have in the specifications. And uh, so this, this SDK here specifically already uh, implements an extension model, and extensions are effectively application-specific or framework-specific elements that you may add to a cloud event that we also have in this repo. For instance, since um, there are 400 different tracing frameworks in the world, each with their own kinds of properties, um, those it makes no sense to kind of you know, bet on exactly one tracing set of ex uh, properties. So we make that an extension, and you can go and add that. Um, in terms of how you send and receive um, here for sending, that's the example for um, the HTTP client. You create a cloud event as, as previously, and then um, you create in, in the, with the system.net uh, HTTP client, you create these content objects. And content objects are effectively the, the, the data you send with an HTTP request. So we have here cloud event content, which is a specialization of the binary content. And then you stiff the stuff the cloud event there event in there. You select what content mode you want. Is that you know, projected onto the HTTP free onto the HTTP frame, or is it contained in the HTTP frame? And then you choose the formatter, and then you use the completely normal regular HTTP client as it comes out of the box in the .NET framework, and go and send. Um, on the server side, 
Um, this is the code that actually runs in the demo for um, the Azure function. Um, I'll show you that. So here's the function. And that function um, implements a, a function matlibs. And that's effectively constructed the URI that I give to Doug. Um, and uh, it will first check whether that incoming request is a webhook validation request. Here, in this case, we're using extensions to C Sharp classes to do this. So this is, um, there's, in the webhook spec, we have a validation request that allows a server to opt into whether it gets pushed to, um, and also allows the, the pushing agent to kind of have a handshake so that it doesn't get abused as a distributed denial of service machine. And so that's the implementation of that two lines. And then um, effectively, you get, uh, you take the request, you turn that into a cloud event, and then you go, we go and handle that cloud event in the end. Um, at the bottom of this, once we constructed one, um, these are the various categories, and I made them explicit. I could have made them, uh, but I want to make them explicit. Um, and then you basically post back um, using the regular HTTP API, uh, uh, encapsulating the event content. Now, that was uh, the C Sharp the C -sharp version. Now, the Go SDK um, has a very similar model. Um, they have uh, here a notion of a marshaller. Um, so what I do in the C Sharp SDK um, with uh, extension methods um, to the base classes, uh, request classes, is done here with an explicit class called the marshaller. And um, so you create. Um, you use this marshaller, and then the marshaller can go and extract from an incoming request a cloud event, and then you can go and uh, print that out. And here's the Go version of how to create one of those cloud events. That's the OM. So again, you see that echo. You see the principles echo here. It's the existing HTTP stack. You have an OM, and then um, here, when you create an HTTP request, again, you create one of those um, uh, requests. Then you turn um, effectively, that uh, marsh with the marshaller, you turn it into a request you can then sw send with a normal, regular <coughs> HTTP stack. The JavaScript SDK, again, brings you an OM for the cloud event. And then um, it uh, allows you to um, go and format the payload here. So you can actually go and get the payload in uh, string format. And uh, if you want to emit an event, which means you want to send it over HTTP, here, um, the JavaScript API is, API is a little different. Um, it has a binding to a particular format, and then you call that, uh, and then you basically, with that binding, you emit, and that's how you send that with HTTP. Again, there's a few um, you know, differences, flavor differences, I would say, between the different kinds of uh, um, uh, SDKs. And none of this stuff is final. If you find that uh, um, you need to have more coverage for more APIs, um, please do so. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out is that, scrolling a little bit further down, um, what the C Sharp SDK does, it already supports MQP. So you can go and make this work with um, MQP compliant uh, brokers. And it also supports MQTT, so that you can go and use the same event, but you can send this to different um, um, uh, systems. And you can build, and that's also one key goal that we have, um, you can build intermediaries. You can receive an event from, via HTTP. You can then extract that, turn that into this abstract OM, and then map it on to, HTTP, to AMQP. So you can make an HTTP gateway that then routes those events further um, over an AMQP broker. And as we get you know, final with specs for Kafka, um, et cetera, and then implementations for them, um, you can see that we, you, can, uh, you can create these multi-layer um, uh, event flows, which then traverse protocols as needed for um, you know, routing in the infrastructure, which is not all um, HTTP. So now, do I just click that present thing? Um, so in the slides, which you can download, we have uh, um, for your reference um, also a few samples in here. And then um, the status. So, oh, am I on? There we go. Thank you. No. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I was going to say something. I can't remember what I was going to say. Okay. Anyway, so status of cloud events. So last Thursday, December 6th, we actually voted and approved 
version 0 0.2 of the specification. Um, while the number is actually really, really low, um, this is just me speaking, I actually think we're probably closer to a 0.9, to be perfectly honest, because um, the, the roadmap actually says for 0.2, we need to try to finalize the set of core properties or required properties of the specification. And we haven't had a new one really pop up in quite some time. So in my opinion, I think we're actually really, really close to the point where once we finalize a couple of um, optional properties that's being, that are being discussed right now, I think we're going to start entering the, entering the stage of testing and verifying the specification itself, yeah. which is what we expected to do between 0.9 and 1.0. So don't let the 0 0.2 numbers scare you a little. Yeah. Um, now, we, uh, along with 0 0.2 of the specification and all the transport bindings that we actually agreed to, one other thing that we just produced recently, which goes along with the SDK stuff Clemens was talking about, is we actually produced a sort of overriding specification may be a little bit strong of a word, more like a design document, sort of a guiding principles for all the SDKs. Because we wanted to try to make sure that there's a, a similar and consistent look and feel across all the SDKs. So as people go from language to language, they don't feel like they're doing cloud events in a completely different way. Um, obviously, there will be some differences because languages are different. <coughs> but we're trying our best to try to get some level of consistency across them. Again, just to make it easier for the user. So as I sort of talked a little bit about, Already, what's left for version 1.0? You know, agree that we actually did finalize the list of core properties. I think we're pretty much there right now, but we need to get a formal vote that yes, this is it. Yep. Finalize the set of protocols. Um, there are one or two that are sort of lingering that we need to sort of decide on that people have proposed. Uh, finish up documentation, uh, write maybe a developer guide, user guide type stuff. As I said, we have a primer, but that was more of a philosophy design type document, maybe something a little bit more technical in nature. And then we need to start testing this thing out, right? More interop demos, verification, get people to actually start implementing this in their products to actually make sure this thing works beyond cool demos like Mad Libs, right? Yep. Um, obviously, complete the SDKs and any additional tooling that we may think may be necessary for the community to really jump on board here. We have toyed with the idea of some sort of conformance checker. I think in the repo itself, under one of the web pages, we have a list of uh, open source projects that use cloud events to some extent. In there is actually some sort of cloud event sort of verification tool where you can send it a cloud event and it tells you whether yes or no it complies to the spec. Something like that is a good starting point for maybe a more formal compliance checker tool that we can look at going uh, at in the future. Mm -hmm. So after 1.0, I already touched on this a little. What's probably going to happen is we'll kick everything, I mean, the, 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 the group of people will probably kick everything back up to the serverless working group to figure out what we're going to do next. We've already started looking at workflow itself, and I'll go about that in a second. But we need to figure out, OK, is workflow the next thing we're only going to do, or is there something else we want to do in addition to it? We're still trying to figure that out. That's what the group needs to decide. Now, workflow itself, um, Kathy, who's sitting over there from Huawei, will actually go into this more detail on Thursday, or maybe it's tomorrow. Whenever tomorrow. The, tomorrow, whenever the deep dive is. Um, but basically, you, think, you can think of workflow as um, defining the, the, the uh, well, basically, the flow of what happens to the various functions as events come in. So, for example, you have event one coming in, it hits one function, maybe it gets split into to two to hit two different functions, and it comes back together to come into step three. Defining all that sort of workflow of how messages flow between the various functions, when function gets invoked, and when and yeah. how, that kind of stuff, all part of sort of the workflow. Uh, sub-project that we're looking at right now. And as I said, I didn't do it justice at all. I probably butchered it. So Kathy will completely explain it for real tomorrow during the deep dive. But with that, we're basically at the end. Have some interesting links here for the serverless working group, the workflow document, which is technically part of the serverless working group, not cloud events. It's just we talk about it in the same group because it's all the same people. Links for the cloud event specifications themselves. And then tomorrow we have the deep dive session again at 4.30. And thank God I put stickers on there. We have stickers for you guys to pick up, because I keep forgetting to hand those out. I forgot in Shanghai as well. But we can do that after we take questions, because I think we have about five minutes or so for questions, if you guys have any. Which subs? While I get out the stickers. No questions? Oh, yes. direction here. <laughs> Rather than me. Because otherwise, I'm going to ask myself one. <laughs> So the 500-pound um, gorilla in the room for serverless is AWS Lambda. Are Amazon on board with this? Um, Amazon has been participating in the calls, yes. Um, in, in, in how far you know, anybody implements that in their services, we'll see. Um, but uh, as I said, AWS has been participating in the calls. Uh, they don't participate in a lot of standards calls, so I'm optimistic. 
Yeah, they, they're part of the serverless working group as well as cloud events. Yeah. So yes. Any other questions? Oh. Yeah, just a quick question. When it comes to the type of event, are you essentially using URI space to avoid uh, namespace conflicts with event types, or, or what's the thought there to keep you know issues with people naming the same events or creating the same events? Um, the, the convention in the specification is to use reverse DNS notation. Um, that is suggested. It's not required. Because you might be building something that is literally just for your own um, uh, um, system. So for instance, in, in Azure, um, all of our events are qualified with Microsoft. So they're Microsoft.Azure.Blob, whatever. We happen to, to own the TLD Microsoft. So they're compliant. So that's kind of, you know, it's, it's, um, it's meant to be disambiguated with the reverse DNS name. But you can go and build your own. There's not. It's not a must rule. It's a. It's a. It's a suggestion. So uh, a follow up to that. Um, you know, say at Microsoft you have the Dynamics group, and the Dynamics group creates a whole set of events uh, yes. to be to enable interop, and then a customer goes and they implement that, and they take one of those events, and there are custom attributes that they want to put in the payload. Do they still use the Microsoft name, or do they extend the event, or do they create essentially an event that's extended from that in theory, but is actually its own unique event? Uh, in a sense, can you extend events or inherit events or that sort of thing? Um, you can you can so you can always extend events. Um, for your event type, you're supposed to have a unique identifier, and then there's also a uh, um, a, a qualifier for it um, in terms of um, the the source where it comes from. And you can obviously go and add a version number to the to the type if you wanted to. So you can make it .v2 if it's compa completely incompatible. Um, so there's enough qualification that allows you to keep your event uh, uh, unique. My personal stance on this, and, and we've had a long, discu long discussions about this in the working group, is um, that it is always in the interest of the event producer to produce an events in a way that they don't clash with the rest of the world. Um, so there's, if you, I think you can trust in a lot of implementation discipline and, and design discipline rather than creating some really onerous uh, requirements um, in the standard itself on um, developers who might build a smaller scope solution, and then you're forcing them into something that's enormously complicated. So, so my take on that is it's up to the producer to decide, right? Because they could obviously roll their own new event type with their own URL or whatever you want to call it. Um, and, but then it's basically incompatible with what they were subclassing, basically, yes. right? We do allow for extensions. You can't extend things. Um, and I would recommend you actually do do that because if you want your event to be picked up by somebody who doesn't know about the extensions, you know, you want the old event type that you passed around. Yes. So, but it is up to the producer to decide whether they create a new event type or use the existing one plus extensions. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Yes. So I hear that uh, Knative is already uh, so compliant with uh, um, uh, cloud events. Well, who, who uh, what uh, service framework or middleware are, are already uh, compliant or close to compliance? So you, you're you're right. Cloud uh, Cloud Native is using it under the covers. Um, I'm sorry, Kate. What did I say? Cloud Native. Yeah, Knative Native is using it. Um, I don't think. I, I, I'm not going to talk to any product specific, although I know you probably do want to talk about one in particular. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> Azure Event Grid is, is already uh, is compliant with version 1, 0 0.1. Um, and we have not, so, so as we announced 0 0.1, um, we did make an extra effort to have something that allowed us to do this. Um, we're going we're gonna to do the work of implementing 0 0.2 in the near future as it fits with the, with the schedule. Um, but we'll, we'll pick this up, and as soon as the final version comes out, we're also going to support this. So that means effectively you can get all events across the entire Azure platform that supports Event Grid. You can have those delivered as cloud events, and we'll also understand cloud events. All right. Any other questions? I think we have time for maybe one more. So 
So uh, are things like uh, the consumption batch sizes in the purview of uh, uh, the cloud, cloud events SDK, or is that outside of uh, like uh, saying things like I want to consume a thousand messages off the wire at a time, as opposed uh, to one at a time? The so that is something that you will do with your normal, your regular uh, protocol SDK, right? Okay. So you'll have an HTTP listener, and the HTTP listener use you use normal HTTP listener API or the normal AMQP uh, API with it. And what the SDKs do is they can go and harvest a cloud event effectively from the the, the transport frame that that comes there. And may that be the binary format where the metadata is projected onto the header structure of the underlying transport frame, and then the, the, the payload is the payload of the transport frame, or that self-contained model where um, that is all sitting in the payload. One thing we, we're, we're not doing in, in cloud events is to do the, we're abstracting everything mistake that happened with SOAP, um, but we're literally using the transport frames to carry all the metadata. Cool. I think with that, we're done. Thank you guys very much for attending. Thank you.